Hi there. We're coming to the end of our uh, C4C webinar series. It's the second last webinar tonight. This one is the last of the Intro to the Energy System uh, webinars. Next week we've got a webinar from ISF on their network opportunity maps and the opportunities for community energy groups to understand where there might be value uh, in providing uh, decentralised energy, energy efficiency, demand management services to the grid. Um, but before we get to that next week, uh, we're going to talk today about how would 100% renewables work. Um, can I just get someone to chat that they can hear me okay? Great. Thanks, Brian. Excellent. Good to know it's all working. All right, well, let's kick off. So in this webinar, um, and hopefully I'll speak for just about half an hour and then we'll have some conversation, uh, we're going to cover an overview of the main 100% renewable research in Australia, and there's been quite a lot of it um, over the last few years. Um, then I'm going to cover what the different elements of a renewable energy future or uh, uh, the future energy system would look like under 100% renewables. I'm going to do a little bit of myth busting and then a little bit of a status check for how are we are progressing uh, towards renewables around the country. So uh, without further ado, let's kick off into the research overview. And I, I think it's really important to know that all of the studies have shown that 100% renewables is 100% doable for Australia. If uh, anything, we technically could decarbonise Australia much more easily than many other parts in the world. Uh, we have such amazing renewable energy resources. We're one of the sunniest, sunniest countries, uh, we're the sunniest country in the world, or at least continent, and we are one of the windiest. Uh, we have a relatively low population base, a relatively low manufacturing base, and that means that our electricity use is smaller than a lot of other countries. And then we've got a lot, a lot of land available to us. So all of that combined to make it uh, easier from a technical perspective to get to 100% renewables. And that's what we're going to talk about. So the research... Uh, around 100% renewables really kicked off uh, with beyond zero emissions. The Zero Carbon Australia Stationary Energy Plan, which was researched by a network of volunteer researchers in 2008, 2009, and they launched it in 2010. And it showed that we could get to 100% renewables in 10 years in Australia. The report has a big reliance on wind and concentrating solar thermal. Wind, because at that point in time, it was the cheapest form of renewable energy and actually still is and concentrating solar thermal because it provided the um, the firm or on-demand renewables capacity that we needed to make sure that uh, electricity would be available at all the times that we need it to be available. Uh, so while the since 2010, the portfolio of different technologies that we're talking about uh, for Australia and the transition to 100% renewables in Australia is different from what BZE was talking about in 2010. It really kick-started the conversation. Uh, and what it led to was the next uh, report, which was done by the Australian Energy Market Operator in 2013. So... As part of the Clean Energy Future Package, that was a, a deal between the Gillard government, uh, the crossbench uh, independents like Tony Windsor, um, as well as the Greens, they negotiated to incorporate the Australian Energy Market Operator doing a study uh, of whether 100% renewable uh, energy elect would be feasible for Australia's electricity sector. And what this modelling showed is that absolutely 100% renewable electricity is 100% doable and it can meet current reliability standards. Uh, they modelled how much it would cost. Those costs are now obviously out of date. Unfortunately, they didn't compare it to a baseline or a business as usual, which is 
uh, frustrating because it doesn't give you any sense of what to compare to. Uh, there's been since, since been done analysis around that, but not by AMO. Um, what, one of the key findings that it found is, yes, 100% renewables doable with the technology that was available back in 2013, but you would need to increase the amount of installed capacity of renewable generation or of generation in uh, uh, Australia's electricity system. And particularly, you know, we have about 47 gigawatts of installed capacity in just the NEM, so the, the eastern states, not Western Australia or Northern Territory. Um, but you'd probably be talking about doubling or tripling that. And it also said that you need a, a portfolio of different technologies. There isn't one silver bullet technology, so you've got to have a range. Moving on, uh, the University of New South Wales and particularly the Centre for Energy and My Environmental Markets there has over a number of years done a number of studies into 100% renewable electricity. Uh, they've got a great summary um, that they released in 2016, which I think is the best summary of the research out there of what is needed to get to 100% renewable. So I really commend that to you if you're interested in finding out more. And it's quite um, relatively untechnical and unjargonistic, so you know, a bit, but it, it's designed for policymakers, not engineers. Um, what they found is similar to others uh, that you need a portfolio of technologies but what they've also found that is that if you increase the transmission infrastructure so if you do more uh, grid connection bet between say south australia and queensland that you start to then use utilize different weather regimes uh, and it actually reduces the amount that you need to install in each individual state. So while transmission infrastructure is expensive, overall more transmission infrastructure will decrease the cost because you won't have to install as much renewable electricity, uh, renewable generation. Moving on, uh, so this was a study I was actually involved in when I was working at the Institute for Sustainable Futures at the University of Technology, Sydney. Uh, it was commissioned by Get Up and Solar Citizens, and um, it was actually undertaken by ISF, but using the model uh, developed by the, and run by the German Space Agency, who actually do all of the modelling for the European Union and the German government around their energy venga, the, the energy transition over there. And what it found is that, yes, you could reach 100% renewable energy. And I, this was a study into total energy, not just electricity. So it looked at the energy for electricity, for transport and for industry, and particularly heat. And it found that we could get to pretty much 100% renewable energy by 2050. And the first part to decarbonise would be uh, the electricity sector and that you could get to 100% renewable electricity for stationary energy only uh, by 2030 and then 100% renewable electricity for all purposes by 2035. And why we say that is what we're going to see is a lot of fuel switching. So electric vehicles and industry uh, switching their uh, energy demand, say, from gas to electricity. So electricity demand is going to go up. Um, and if you just look at it, you know, the demand that we will need for, for supplying what electricity does right now, we can get to 100% renewables by 2030. And that means we can shut all coal-fired power stations down by 2030. What it found was actually the most difficult part to decarbonise will be our industrial processes, our highly heat intensive processes particularly. And so we're going to start to need things called synthetic fuels and things like uh, renewable hydrogen. I'm going to talk through the results of this study in more detail, so I'll talk about how you, what that means. But one of the, the good things it did model was we modelled three scenarios that uh, are a business as usual scenario, a, a mid-level scenario and a, and a um, this scenario and it found that this would actually pay for itself because after you've built the renewables the fuel is for the, the, um, the wind turbines and the solar panels and the, the 
fuel predominantly is free. So the, the amount of fuel savings we get, particularly from the transport sector, from not importing a heap of oil, can actually save, saves us a lot more money than it would to invest in all of this. So the, the fuel savings basically pay for the, that um, capital spend. I'm not saying that, um, I'm saying that the numbers balance that way with a net saving to us all, to the Australian economy of 90 billion, if we do that. Finally, uh, onto the Electricity Network Transformation Roadmap. So this was undertaken by CSIRO and Energy Networks Australia, which is the peak body for energy network, uh, network companies, distribution and transmission companies in Australia. And it uh, was released earlier this year, and it was looking at how do you switch to 100% renewable uh, energy by 2050, and it found that doing so would save consumers about $414 per year on their energy bills. And the main reason for that is that networks are operated more efficiently with smarter distributed generation and storage. So, so we, we get smarter in our electricity use, not bigger. Um, they also found, and I think this is really interesting, that customer-owned generators would supply 30 to 45% of Australia's electricity needs. So that means we go from a centralised electricity system, which was almost 100% centralised, with 85% of it coming from very large coal-fired power stations, to a situation where 35 to 40, 30 to 45%, so almost half, a third to a half of our electricity is coming from people like you and I and decentralised renewables. So that, that's a real transformation in thinking about how our electricity system works. Uh, the final study uh, is the Australian National University, so particularly Andrew Blaker's research. I'm sure a number of you will have seen a, few, a month or two back, he released a big study funded by ARENA that looks at um, the number of different pumped hydro locations that there are across Australia, which number in the hundreds. Um, well, they basically did some modelling to look at what, how you could get to 100% renewable electricity using a greater degree of pumped hydro than the other scenarios we're looking at, and that the findings were you, know, you could do that um, for as low as 7.4 cents a kilowatt hour overall, which um, is definitely cheaper than our average wholesale electricity price right now. It's more expensive than we used to have, um, but it's cheaper than we have right now. So that's a step in the right direction. It basically says going to 100% renewables will lower our wholesale prices rather than rise, raise them. Are there any questions before I move on to talk about some of the results? Okay, I'm going to keep going. I will say that other organisations have um, modelled high penetrations of renewables or zero carbon electricity systems. Uh, Climate Works, the Climate Institute, Melbourne Energy Institute, SKM, MLA, but I'm not going to go into all of those. Um, the reason I haven't put them up specifically is mainly because they haven't been specifically about 100% renewables. They've still included things like clean coal or nuclear or those kinds of options, and they're just not ones that, to my mind, are relevant anymore. So key findings of some of this research, uh, I, like I said, I'm gonna look at the Institute for Sustainable Futures study. So this, I told you it was about total energy, not just electricity. Uh, so, and it was off a baseline of 2015, which is just over halfway across this graph. What you can see is that coal and oil are the two largest uh, fuels for our energy needs at the moment. Um, followed by some gas, and then an ever-increasing role for renewables. But actually, by 2030, the biggest chunk of our energy needs will be met, actually, by the energy that we don't use, which is what we call energy productivity, or um, which is basically a fancy word for energy efficiency. So if we double our energy productivity, which means that we, um, for every unit of uh, GDP, we the input... Um, the energy input is half of what it was in 2015. That's what doubling energy productivity means. Um, 
uh, we will save a huge amount and that's really the biggest fuel that we need to get right is the energy efficiency fuel not that it's a fuel but it's the the component of the transition that we often we so often forget uh, renewables is going to from about 2015 to 2030 uh, triple in capacity uh, or in output uh, triple or quadruple probably quadruple um, what you see there is coal declines to 2030 so we're completely out of coal by the end of 2030 um, this is not a prediction, it's a scenario that is a feasible scenario. We still use oil, but the amount has declined slightly. We still use gas, but again, gas, the amount has declined slightly. And then over the following years, between 2030 to 2050, we get out of oil and gas entirely. So what about the energy mix? Well, this is a very colourful and complicated graph. Um, if you can pick your way through the colours, basically what this shows is that wind and solar by 2050 and even by 2030, will, which are the yellow and the, the blue bars, uh, will provide the bulk of our energy needs. The bits that are highlighted or, or um, outlined in red are the amount of wind and solar we need to power our transport. So it specifies, you know, this is additional capacity because uh, under business as usual, the expectation is that we won't have many electric vehicles at all. Um, and I, when I say business as usual, I should really say the reference case because the reference case is based on uh, government assumptions, which are very far from actual business as usual. Concentrating solar thermal, uh, hydro, a bit of bioenergy, potentially in the future a bit of marine energy, ocean energy will all play a role. Um, and over time you can see coal phases out, whereas under the reference scenario you'll see that coal actually increases, which is completely incompatible with our climate targets and what we need to be doing for um, reducing greenhouse gas emissions. So what does this mean for costs? Well, uh, basically we reduce the amount of money we spend as a nation on energy. Uh, the costs go up for a little while, um, but then they come down and in significant part because more than half of the money that we spend as a nation on energy goes to petrol, it goes to oil. Um, actually stationary um, power supply in 2015 only accounted for about a quarter of the energy that the money we spend on energy so really you know thinking about it holistically shows you know the huge opportunities for for making us, the australian economy more productive and more self-reliant through using homegrown renewables um what you'll see if you look towards 2050 is there's a pink bar um which is sin fuel product pow production power basically to decarbonise our industri industrial sectors, we're going to need um, not just electricity, but some kind of other fuel. Um, there is a huge amount that's happening at the moment around the production of renewable hydrogen. And then once you create renewable hydrogen, then you can use that to create synthetic methane. So rather than fossil fuel methane that we mine from the ground or extract from the ground, this, ha this is a, a chemical process where you use electricity. So when the sun is shining a lot and the wind is blowing a lot, you use electricity to crack water into oxygen and hydrogen. The hydrogen then can get used directly as a fuel or it can be used uh, to, and combined to create synthetic hydro hydrocarbons. And because it's part of the hydrological cycle, it actually doesn't add more carbon emissions to the, the atmosphere. It's actually just speeding up an existing natural process. Um, so, you know, that's all, you know, in terms of costs and, and the fuel savings covered 110% of the bill for building the renewable power that we need. So the final thing on the results around this is the emissions. Uh, we go to zero emission in our entire energy system by 2050. We decarbonise our electricity system by 2030. So we're dropping our energy emissions by more than half um, by 2030, which is in line with what climate, the climate uh, institute, no, um, 
climate work suggests is needed if we are to be serious about meeting our Paris targets. Uh, are there any questions about these results? They're, you know, just like the results of any modelling, they're pretty technical. Okay, let's move on then. I don't have slides for the next section. Uh, I just suppose I wanted to talk you through what some of the key features of a 100% renewable electricity system will look like. So it'll start off with, like I just said, wind and solar, the cheapest forms of clean renewable power, so solar PV specifically, will, will provide the bulk of our electricity needs. And those wind and solar plants will be built in the places where the, the sun shines longest and the wind blows strongest. So we're going to need some new transmission lines to get at that. Places like the Eyre Peninsula, uh, the Queensland government has just announced funding for uh, a new transmission line to Northwest Queensland, which is where we have some of the best solar resources in the world. Um, and uh, those big solar and wind projects are going to power our transport, our industry and our cities. Then this low cost wind and solar is going to be complemented by on-demand renewables so, and storage. So technologies like concentrating solar thermal, pumped hydro, batteries, uh, both grid scale and domestic. So. On your in your garage as well as just like what's happened in South Australia. Also there'll be a role for sustainable bioenergy and by sustainable I mean sustainable uh, and South Australia is really leading on this. It, it, the getting the on-demand or the flexible dispatchable um, clean energy technologies has been a gap in the Australian energy policy landscape. Uh, the South Australian government's announcement around concentrating solar thermal for Port Augusta and the Tesla big battery are really the first big forays we've had into that. So we're going to need to do more on that because they'll account for something like a quarter of our electricity needs, but they're, they're an essential part to be able to get up, start to get up beyond 40, 50, 60% uh, renewables. Then we use, as I showed with the energy productivity slide, we're gonna use energy much more efficiently. Uh, we need to make sure that our houses and buildings are no longer leaky tents, and we need to make our equipment our appliances more efficient, and our industrial processes. Large-scale renewable uh, energy efficiency is going to be critical. Then just, you know, we, we think a lot about the supply side, but the demand side is in the future is actually going to be as important as supply. Uh, you may have seen recently Arena and AMO have announced uh, a trial for demand management projects. Uh, these are mainly industrial energy users that are happy to be sent a signal to turn off some of their pumps or some of their heating and cooling loads for an hour or two to make sure that um, we don't have a blackout or that we don't need to build lots of extra new generators and poles and wires. So this demand management process um, you know, is, is extremely cost effective. People get paid to do it and it saves all of us a lot of money. Um, it happens a lot overseas. Uh, we've already done it, like we've been doing it for years in terms of off-peak hot water, but we're going to need to get more sophisticated about it because we we'll want to have things like when the sun is shining the most in the middle of the day and it's a really windy day, you want to send a signal to, to your washing machine to turn on or to your electric vehicle to start charging. And demand will start to follow supply as much as supply follows demand. And what I mean is at the moment, uh, electricity uh, supply is based on how much forecast demand there is. Uh, in the future, we'll be able to balance the two much more dynamically. Thinking about the nature of the grid and where things are, we have one of the biggest and skinniest grids in the world, one of the longest. We're going to take some communities off the grid where it's, it's already cost effective to do that. Um, in Western Australia, they're trying to take 100 communities off the grid, small communities, and these communities will be powered by microgrids with solar and wind and um, batteries and probably in the short term diesel, but hopefully not. Um, and that will basically save us all money and 
increase the reliability of electricity supply to those communities where uh, transmission lines often, or what we call swirl lines, often fall down. So I've talked about the big stuff, the demand stuff, the grid. Um, there's also the decentralised end of the spectrum. So I said um, CSIROs expect a third of or to a half of our electricity come to come from local energy systems. So we're going to need to do some work to make sure that all Australians, all businesses, all organisations, all households can access directly the benefits of clean energy. So solar and storage and um, community initiatives. Um, you know, there are great examples around the world of that, solar gardens, uh, there are some new startup organisations like Sun Tenants that are starting to try and address that, but there's a lot more work to do to make that um, a really equitable part of the energy transition, but that's where we're headed, that's where we need to be going. Um, the, I, there's a lot of talk, uh, or there has been, about the death spiral, the idea that lots of households will go off the grid or at least take, reduce their, the amount of electricity they use from the grid, that's already happening. But then the people who uh, can least afford to pay for our very expensive grid will be left paying the bill, footing the bill. So how do we avoid that? Um, well, we do it in two ways. One is we incentivise um, households and businesses to use the network infrastructure that we have. So instead of load defecting, actually starting to do energy trading, local energy trading and peer-to-peer -peer and things like that. Um, we need to get the tariff settings right and the incentives right to be able to do that because at the moment they incentivise people to go off the grid. And then while households, while we become more um, energy efficient at a household level, because of the fuel switching, because we switch from petrol in our transport sector to electricity and from gas in our industrial sector to electricity, actually the amount of electricity demand goes up significantly. So that's what starts to pay for our grid infrastructure costs. So I think we can, if we're proactive, very much avoid the death spiral, but it needs a change in course to what's happening right now. One of the concerns about the future of our electricity system is, well, climate change means that there are going to be a lot more extreme weather events. There were poles and wires blown down in Victoria and South Australia over the last weekend, and that's going to increase, not decrease. So the idea of microgrids, of whole suburbs or towns being able to be self-sufficient on their for electricity for certain periods of time is where we need to be going to make our electricity system in the future much more resilient. This already happens in Denmark, in, in Europe, uh, where for whole for six hours at a time, uh, the Danish uh, energy network, uh, energy market operator, their equivalent to AMO, uh, is able to take whole towns off the grid um, for about six hours at a time. And that means that they can dynamically manage the system knowing that each of those towns has enough renewable capacity and battery storage and you know, demand response capacity to be able to be self-sufficient for a short time. And that means that if a big transmission line out to Broken Hill goes down, you can still island what we call island uh, Broken Hill to make it energy self-sufficient. And it doesn't even have to be as far away as Broken Hill. It could be a suburb in Sydney. So what about our industry? So I mentioned renewable hydrogen earlier. Well, we need to start to develop that technology. And, and one of the ideas that we've thought about is, well, Heating is the main need, um, the, one of the most difficult things to do, but there are actually renewable technologies that generate heat, uh, concentrating solar thermal, sustainable bioenergy being two of them. So why not co-locate our emissions, uh, our heat intensive industry next to those types of plants and create what we, we're calling renewable industry precincts, where you lay down thermal uh, you know, piping not just water pipes, but heating pipes and cooling pipes, um, and use the heat from the, the concentrating solar thermal and the bioenergy to um, actually heat our different industrial processes.
Um, there's a good question around microgrids. I'm going to come back to it in just a second. And I'm just going to finish what I'm saying around industry and transport. Um, those industrial um, industrial precincts also could be places where we locate the um, um, renewable hydrogen uh, generation. Um, and then, which can also be used to create heat, and then we can also use that to start exporting renewable energy. And there's a huge demand, particularly from our major trading partners in uh, Japan and South Korea already for renewable hydrogen, for zero emissions fuels. So that type of thing is looking to already be happening. Um, and it can also be used to, that kind of renewable hydrogen can also be used to um, to for our um, heavy industry, our heavy, um, not our heavy industry, our heavy transport, uh, transporting garbage trucks and freight and things like that. Because uh, until recently, I had been told by energy experts that mo that electric vehicles and batteries wouldn't be up to the task of, of uh, really, they don't have enough grunt, enough oomph behind them, enough power to, to you know, haul really heavy things. Uh, however, uh, renewable hydrogen uh, absolutely can do that. And we're seeing Darwin Council in Victoria is doing a garbage truck trial on renewable hydrogen. Now, look, the, the Tesla uh, haulage uh, semi-trailers uh, that have just you know, been announced may prove me wrong, but uh, you know, I think that there's a still a big question around that. Um, so going back to the question, let me just bring up the question. The question from Haley was, if small towns go off grid, how do you think extreme weather events will affect those microgrids? Better for the larger grids, but wouldn't there need to be greater resilience inbuilt into the microgrids? Absolutely, there would need to be um, resilience built into the microgrids. But one of the biggest um, risk factors or, or weaknesses in our electricity system is our big transmission lines that get blown over or, um, you know, spark in heat and cause bushfires and things like that. They're, they're really the weak point. So the idea of having more microgrids um, um, and smaller towns going off the grids um, will actually increase the resilience uh, overall. Um, do we need to make sure that there's enough capacity in those communities? Absolutely. Um, we're probably going to have to overbuild. This is the type of thing that network companies particularly are starting to grapple with. Um, and it's not just in Western Australia and Queensland, it's places like Tasmania and Western New South Wales. Um, I think you know, a lot of age of grid towns and households and, and farms already have you know, less good power quality uh, and more blackouts than we experience in the cities. Um, so hopefully that this could actually increase energy security and reliability and power quality um, rather than decrease it. I hope that answers your question, Haley. Um, so that's sort of my overview of how I think that the future energy system will fit together and how different technologies will play their different roles. And I think that, you know, the research shows that you need a portfolio of different technologies. And I tried to illustrate those different roles that they would play. One more chat. Um, no worries. Uh, okay, so let's move on. I've just got a few more slides. So it's about half past six. I'll probably go for five or a few minutes more. So some myth busting, um, building on what uh, what I've just been talking about. So the first concept is baseload. Uh, a lot of people will say, oh, we can't have a future electricity system without baseload. The thing is, the concept of baseload is kind of bullshit. Sorry for swearing, but it is. The idea of baseload is was built around or is a concept that's a technical concept based on thermal power stations. It's not a technical or absolute requirement for a reliable, affordable, secure electricity system. So the cheapest technology back in the, te the 50s was big thermal power stations. Uh, in Australia, there were coal. In other places, there were coal and nuclear. And they didn't they were very slow to start up. It takes a couple of days to power up a coal-fired power station. And they didn't like to fluctuate. They basically like and they're most efficient to run if they run the same amount all day, every day. 
so that most are cost effective, most, you know, to mission effective to, to run that way. And then the thing is, is that, so they, they provide constant power. Um, the thing is, what's not constant is electricity demand. So when electricity demand goes up, they had to be filled the gap by what we call peaking or intermediate plants, typically hydro or gas. Um, and then if overnight demand dipped below what um, coal-fired power stations were wanting to generate, that was a problem. So what they did was introduce uh, off-peak hot water. I'm sure a number of you have, uh, you know, still um, power your, uh, heat your hot water with electricity from overnight, and that's soaking up the excess electricity from coal generators who don't want to ramp down. So that's where the concept of baseload comes from. It comes from the fact that coal and big thermal power stations aren't good at, at ramping up and down quickly. And so, but actually doesn't have any basis in what an electricity system uh, needs to function. It's just, it happens to be the way our electricity system has functioned for more than 50 or 60 years. What we're moving to is a completely new paradigm, a different paradigm of electricity pr provision, which is not based on base, base load and peak load, but rather based on variable and on-demand or dispatchable uh, energy. So variable renewables will, be, will provide the bulk of our electricity need, and that will be wind and solar, and they fluctuate. But the thing about variable is it's also predictable. You, can, you know when the sun rises and when the sun sets, and you know um, to plus or five, minus 5% um, the wind uh, generation that you will get about 24 hours out. So, so you can really predict well how much of that variables or bulk renewables will get. Then what you need is the, the fast start technologies that can ramp up quickly and, and turn off quickly to fill the gaps. And they're the on-demand energy sources or the dispatchable renewables. So they're things like um, concentrating solar thermal, battery storage, pumped hydro, sustainable bioenergy, and also flexible demand. So that idea of load following, um, um, demand following supply as much as supply following demand. And really, if you think about it, base load and coal-fired power stations are completely incompatible with variable solar and, like you can't put that block that block of base load over the top of variable renewables, they eat into it. So let me explain that in some more detail. Basically what happens is that, you know, when you've only got a small amount of renewables, maybe 10, 15%, maybe 25, up to 25%, you've still got room for base load, and then you've got variable renewables of wind and solar, which is the blue block, and then you've got the more flexible or on-demand power, which is a combination of gas, hydro, but also those other sustainable bioenergy, et cetera. The thing is, when you start to get up towards 50% renewables and you know, 30, 40, 50% renewables, wind and solar is starting to, to you know, generate much more of the time and forces coal to switch off. That eats into the business the business case and also, you know, it, it's very difficult for coal to, to turn off and on quickly. And then those gaps are filled by, you know, those on-demand renewables. And then finally, what the optimised mix of renewables going forward, you know, where we, when we're getting towards 100% renewables is, is that wind and solar that's fluctuating and then a bunch of bioenergy um, and um, on-demand renewables. This is, this is a model based on uh, actually Europe where the technical requirements are slightly different and there's this load shifting or demand response. But, but there's just absolutely no space in this load curve for coal-fired power stations. Basically, one of the key ideas I want to get across to you is that coal is technically incompatible with uh, solar and wind when the share of solar and wind is starting to get much higher. It's not what we need to deliver a reliable and secure energy system. And the, what we need are things that turn on and off quickly and batteries and concentrating solar thermal and pumped hydro are great for that.
other myths and other areas. So uh, there's, you know, ser- you know electricity is a, a, an essential service. We need it to be secure and we need it to be reliable. We need to be able to provide what we call black start capacity. So if, if things, um, if the whole system goes down, you need to be able to kickstart it again and you need something with a, a lot of oomph and rotational force to be able to do that. You need, potentially, you might need things like synchronous generation that provides um, inertia. These are technical terms where basically synchronous means rotational um, and it, it, what it does is provide greater power quality to the system and the ability for an electricity system to ride through shocks, um, so fluctuations. Uh, that synchronous, uh, then there's you know, things like frequency control and reactive power, you know, there's this term of intermittent. Don't use the term intermittent. It's variable, not intermittent. Variable and predictable. Basically, the, the message around all of this is all of these issues can be dealt with. All of these services can be provided with the right mix of renewables, storage and demand management. And overall, like uh, there was a report out uh, just last week from the, the Australia Institute where they said they found that basically coal-fired generators are really not having a good time in heat waves over summer and they're failing. Uh, you know, just last week there were three units of coal generation that went off, a coal and gas generation that went offline. So basically more modern technologies um, are going to create a more, uh, energy secure and, and reliable and resilient electricity system. And I, I, you know, there's big scare campaign that renewables means unreliable at the moment. That's definitely not true. Renewables are reliable, and in a 100% renewable system will actually be more reliable because it will combine with modern, uh, you know, communications technology and smarts. That means it's just the same as you know, thinking a similar analogy would be around cars. You know, cars um, break down a lot less these days than they used to because we've got smarter at how to run them. Uh, almost last slide. Um, so I talk about variable renewables and on-demand renewables. The variable renewables on, are on the right-hand side, so the wind turbines, and the on-demand are on the left side. If we just had all variable renewables, we'd have to build so many wind turbines and solar panels, it would be insane and very expensive. And the grid integration costs would be significant because they don't work the way our grid was set up to. Um, Whereas if we built all on-demand renewables, like concentrating solar thermal and sustainable bioenergy and batteries, we could do that, except, um, and the grid integration costs would not be too high because they work very much like uh, existing coal and gas generators. The thing is, those technologies are much more expensive than wind and solar. So if we do go to either end of those scales, um, we're getting an expensive uh, electricity system. What we, to get a, a cost-effective 100% renewable electricity system does need the mixture of those technologies to get the lowest cost uh, uh, generation mix and the lowest cost grid integration mix. Any questions on that? Okay, so where are we at? Final last slide. Well, we're on our way, but we've got a way to go. So ACT is going to get there first. They're going to be powered by 100% renewables by 2020. Uh, Tasmania, which is already at 90% renewables, will be at 100% renewables by 2022 at the latest. Uh, following on, uh, Victoria has a commitment of 20 to 25% um, renewables by 2020 and 40% by 2025. Um, they just announced a 650 megawatt uh, reverse auction round to kick that process off. And Victoria was one of the states that probably had the least penetration of renewables, perhaps after Queensland, so that's good. Um, South Australia oh, is actually third, not Victoria. Um, South Australia had a target, the government had a target of 50% renewables by 2025. They have met that this year. 
So South Australia is currently powered by 50% renewables. They don't have a target to exceed it, but you know, there's an election in March, so watch this space. Uh, both the Queensland and Northern Territory governments have a 50% renewables target by 2030, uh, given that the ALP is going to get back in, uh, in some form or fashion in Queensland. Um, I'm pretty damn sure that will continue. It, that leaves just um, Western Australia and uh, New South Wales. Uh, neither of them have targets. Western Australia could get to 100% renewables uh, very easy easily um you know the main challenge it's got some coal generators but really the main challenge is all of their diesel generators in remote communities across western australia uh, in new south wales the new south wales government has a commitment to being zero net emissions by uh, by 2050 which would basically mean 100 percent renewables by then um if not significantly beforehand uh, but certainly a lot more needs to be done in new south wales um, so that's my webinar. I'm going to finish up there. Are there any final? Are there any questions? We've got some time for discussion. Uh, chat. Uh, would I care to comment on the E R O E I controversy? Um, can you expand? Is that the one um, coming out of the US? So there is a, I'm assuming it's the one, the one you're talking about is, is the modelling coming out of the US. Um, oh, Germany. No, I'm, I'm sorry. I don't know what's happening in Germany. Uh, I'm not up to speed, but I can talk about what's happening in the US. Uh, I will look it up. Uh, so what's happening in the US? The, um, there's a guy uh, out of one of the universities, um, the Ivy League universities in the US, who's done a series of 100% renewable studies uh, for the US and a number of countries around the world, including Australia. Um, but he has just powered it based on wind, water and uh, solar, the sun, the wind and the water. And so there are actually, you know, while it's good to have more people coming out and saying 100% renewables is doable, there's some pretty big problems with his methodology, which basically relies on the, the, the cheapest forms of renewables, but not the portfolio of different technologies that we need. Um, so he really oversizes the amount of capacity that's needed. He's talking about like a thousand gigawatts needed in Germany, and that's just, you know, totally crazy. So, you know, it's, um, it's good to have modelling out there that shows 100% renewables is doable, but it would be better to have more robust methodologies, I think, is, is kind of... And, and then there's, you know, some questions around particular egos involved, which, you know, isn't unusual in the world of either politics or engineering. Any other questions? All right, well, it sounds like no more questions from now. I've got some homework to look up what's happening in Germany. Um, Germany has led the way and we should be very thankful to them for making solar cost effective and then China after them, but particularly Germany. Um, but yeah, I know it's not all been smooth sailing over there. Here in Australia, it's certainly not smooth sailing. Uh, the current government is trying to institute a target federal government is trying to institute a target that would basically kill the large-scale renewables industry out to 2030. We can't let that happen. Um, so I'm going to leave it there. It's been lovely doing these webinars. I hope you found them useful, whether you're listening to me right now or you're watching this online. Uh, have a lovely evening, a lovely day. Cheers.